We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program fellow at the Open Markets Institute and author of Goliath, the 100 year war between monopoly power and democracy. Matt Stoller, welcome back to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. So, all right, let's let's start. um, And and basically, the overview of this is is the sort of, um, I guess, the. The sad tale of how the Democratic Party in particular, I mean, brought more broadly our society, um, lost sight of some very important principles that um, made our system work. Let, I mean, let's start just with the general problem that we're facing now. And then I want to go back and follow uh, Wright Patman, who is uh, essentially the... Um, I guess the protagonist of your story who's basically almost in some ways acts as like a narrator and maybe that's a, or just a, a guide, if you will, through that history. But just let's start with just sort of the problem as you see it. Yeah. Like, like spirit animal, maybe not, you know, I think might be a good for, for Patman. Um, yeah. So first of all, I, uh, I, thanks for having me. I think, you know, I started writing this book uh, because I was a, a staffer during the financial crisis and I'm Democrat. And I was like, why did we screw everything up so badly? Right. Why did we allow a foreclosure crisis? Why did we bail out the banks and enable Wall Street executives to get bonuses instead of uh, jail time? What did we do wrong? And because I, I saw you know, what the Obama administration did. I saw what people in Congress did. And I, it was not corrupt. It was not like they were getting bribed for what they were doing. Um, and I was like, what happened? Why did we just systematically promote injustice? And so I looked back over the last century. This kind of led me on a long research project, which ended up in this, in this book. And I, what I figured out um, is that there used to be this whole tradition of attacking and fighting concentrated power. And that's a tradition that has largely been hidden, was at least hidden from me, um, but it was embedded in these kind of rural populist politicians, and uh, Wright Patman is one of them from, from, from Texarkana, who opposed uh, big banks, they opposed monopolies, um, and they opposed them because of, for political reasons. They thought that they were autocrats, that they were sort of... Um, Kind of the, the analogs to fascists in in Europe, and um, and they won uh, in the first half of the century, and then in the second half of the century, although really kind of getting a starting more in the in the 1970s, uh, we allowed our our robber barons to return, and you spin that forward 40 years, and today you have, you know, not just the financial crisis caused by too big to fail banks, but also monopolies. Uh, in every sector of our economy, you know, everything from search and social, which are the big, which are big markets in cable and airlines, to things like peanut butter or, um, uh, or bank management software or syringes, you know, munitions and missiles, just kind of everywhere. Monopolization is a systemic feature of the American economy. And monopolies, what they do, this is the physical manifestation of inequality, right? They increase wage inequality, wealth inequality, regional inequality. They reduce business innovation. They reduce productivity. Uh, they're bad for workers. Um, they prevent, they corrupt our society and our politics. So you can't deal with problems like ch- climate change. Um, you know, and this is, this, it was a philosophical change in the 1970s that led us to think, to transform ourselves from citizens to consumers and led us to think, oh, well, if we just allow the concentration of capital, that that will be more efficient. And that was the philosophy uh, in 2008 that Obama and company and the, you know, the Democrats in general kind of took with them in trying to address a political crisis. They just thought, well, we learned to concentrate power and wealth to, to in the hands of economists and technocratic experts to fix problems. So, wow, we have a really big problem now, this, this huge crisis. So what we really need to do is concentrate wealth and power further to fix that problem. And I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but that, is, that was the philosophy. Those were the lessons that people learned in the 1970s. And to really understand that, you have to get back to uh, 
the the fights over the New Deal, fights over corporate power, and then how those fights manifested in the 1970s and then and 80s, 90s, and 2000s. All right. Well, let's 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 do that. Um, and uh, it, it, and and it goes back. Um, well, I mean, it goes back a hundred years or so. Um, and uh, so, just I mean, let's take us from the sort of the the I guess the 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 nascent era of of anti-monopolism and what and where did that sentiment i mean to a certain extent that sentiment was was at the founding of the country no i mean on some level or was it was it really was that not the case no it was you know the boston tea party is was not just a revolt against taxes uh, it was in fact a revolt because what the boston tea the uh, east india company was was trying to do is they were trying to ship in uh, cheap tea with tax concessions. So in fact, the Boston Tea Party was a was a re- rebellion against lower taxes, because those lower taxes were enabling the the East India Company to monopolize the tea trade, essentially to to drive out of business all of the the middlemen uh, merchants in the colonies, people like John Hancock. Um, it's kind of it was like a like a, a colonial Walmart. That's what the East India Company was, and the Boston Tea Party, and then the tea boycotts were opposition to monopolization. They weren't really opposition to the levying of, of taxes. They were opposition to the use of the tax system to structure markets in a way that would take power from the colonists and move that power to a monopoly corporation headquartered uh, far away in, in England. On some level, that, right, the, the, the analog, the modern day analog would have been Amazon not having to pay sales tax uh, for, for years. Yeah, I think that's right. And and you know what you see is is uh, there was there were a lot of fears at the time in the 17 i guess it was the 1770s you know the the, the east india company had just uh they they were allowed to occupy territory so they had just uh, induced a famine in in the bengal province in india about a million people died and in the kind of north american colonies of the british empire and bengal was part of the british empire they were worried that you know the east india company could do the same thing here if they were able to monopolize the necessities of life so there was a national security element to it but it's always about political power and today you see the same fight with amazon facebook and google who are a governing they are they are private governments that is what a monopoly is they are governing um, our, our information in our society, and in many ways, they are governing our politics. And they, are, we have not seen anything like them, maybe ever, but maybe since the the East India Company, maybe since the robber barons in the late nineteenth century. It's always hard to draw specific analogies, right. but this is a, this is a political problem. And my book doesn't start with the um, East India Company. I, I thought about starting it there, but you know, you you kind of, it's always hard to figure out where to start a history book. Um, but uh, but, you know, I started in 1910 with Teddy Roosevelt giving a speech at Osawatomie, Kansas. It was a hundred years later, Obama actually gave a speech at Osawatomie, Kansas to honor that speech. It was known as the new nationalism speech. And, and it's because the, the election of 1912 was the election uh, when we determined what corporate America would look like. So corporate America really got its start in, in rough like 1894, 95, when J.P. Morgan engineered a, a giant merger wave and created companies like General Electric, International Harvester, U.S. Steel, um, these were giant roll-ups of the technologically advanced organizations of the day. And by 1910, there was sort of this crisis because you had, you know, massive uh, train accidents, you had huge inequality, you had corruption. It was pretty similar to today. And there had been attempts to deal with it. Uh, but the election of 1912 was when you saw uh, a real battle over corporate power. And there were there was Teddy Roosevelt, who's you know he's thought of today as a great trust buster, but in fact he didn't like the antitrust laws. He was more um, he wanted to actually have monopolies running the country. He just wanted the state to run them. It, it was it's almost a, a kind of proto uh, fascist view, although fascism hadn't been created yet. So, but it was just ca- kind of how do we contain industrial power? His view was well, I'll I'll run it. I'll run it out of the White House. Um, and then you had uh, William Howard Taft, who basically didn't want to do much about the monopolies. He just kind of wanted to let private masters run thing, run things. And Teddy Roosevelt wanted public masters to run things, a.k.a. Teddy Roosevelt. And then you had um, Eugene Debs, who in many ways agreed with Teddy Roosevelt, although he wanted to nationalize these monopolies. And then you had Woodrow Wilson, who was advised by Louis Brandeis, uh, 
And he ran on something called the New Freedom, and he ended up winning. And Brandeis's view was we need uh, not just we don't want public masters or private masters. We want no masters. We want to break up these companies, not, you know, not so that there are no economies of scale, but break them up so that you have a competitive marketplace and then regulate business practices so that the markets stay open and competitive. And so that competition leads to things that we think are socially beneficial as opposed to, you know, competing based on fraud or harmful activities. So and that was that was that was sort of the fight. OK, right. so um, and, and we've just sort of laid out the different, I guess, responses that one could have. I mean, for the most part, or at least those who, who want to tackle um, uh, these monopolies. So just in terms of, uh, of of Roosevelt and Debs, in terms of their different perspective on this, um, what was the so from 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 uh, Debs perspective, the idea is right, we're, we're going to democratize. Uh, the means of production in that the state is a reflection of all the people, I guess. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, Debs was a Marxist. I mean, Debs right. wanted to nationalize the means of production. And he also believed like Roosevelt that Matt, where, where'd you get, hold on, Matt, what are you, uh, you walking away from your phone? No. Okay, there no, you go. Sorry about that. I, sorry. Um, hey, so he wanted to, it was Marxist, he wanted to uh, uh, nationalize the means of production. How is that different from what Roosevelt wanted to do? Like, where is the, the difference there in, what, in, in, in terms of sort of the um, philosophical difference? It wasn't really that different. I mean, that, that's the thing is that Roosevelt had a kind of, you know, Roosevelt was was probably kind of had a power sharing arrangement with the with the J.P. Morgans of the day, whereas Debs, I suspect, wanted to just displace them entirely. But philosophically, they weren't that different. In fact, Debs kind of accused Teddy Roosevelt of stealing his platform. OK, fair enough. So um, there it's a it's a difference you're saying in degree as opposed to kind. Yeah. And I mean, you know, Roosevelt was I mean, they were just different. They were different. Uh, characters and Roosevelt was much more into warfare, whereas Debs had a had a kind of international solidarity framework. Uh, but in general, you know, the underlying philosophy was basically the same. Okay, and so uh, those are the ways that uh, one would address this. And uh, Brandeis's um, version wins out, which is um, this idea that um, no one's going to have a concentration of power. Uh, that's right. You're going to have uh, you're going to have like we're going to contain industrial power through uh, through in what he called industrial democracy. Right. And just to give you a sense for why I know it seems crazy to say Eugene Debs and Teddy Roosevelt were basically the same. But think about it. You know, this debate continued into the 1920s and 30s. And what you saw in the 1930s was you saw the you basically saw New Dealers who were the ideological descendants of Brandeis and, and Wilson. They they looked at, at Europe and they said, well, fascism in Germany or communism in the Soviet Union, these are both totalitarian systems. Right. So they they saw them as basically equivalent, one of which was the state taking over the government. And the other one was the government taking over the state. And where would and maybe this is maybe we're leaping ahead a little bit, uh, but but let's have it in this context, because we could have this a similar argument, I guess, or a, a conversation about uh, in terms of Bernie and Warren on some level. And some people are, are certainly having that. Where would the idea of like of of worker owned uh, workers owning the means of production largely? I mean, where where would that fit within that? Or is that largely a um, just a different way of a or, or is that is that is that something that can coexist and really doesn't have any implications necessarily for antitrust? Well, so Brandeis was a big fan of worker co-ops. It's really just about it's more about centralization versus decentralization than, you know, the specific ownership models. So so Debs wanted federal government to own, you know, most of the, the means of, of production. He wasn't totally clear about everything that he wanted, but that's, that, that was sort of the gist of it. Whereas Brandeis and I guess later Keynes um, and new dealers were, were, were interested in owner in workers having ownership. Um, co-ops were always a big part of that. 
you know, of that framework, credit unions, associations, things that allowed people to, you know, essentially it was, it was a for, sort of form of producerism. And producerism says that the, the people that do the work, that produce the goods or services, should be the ones to benefit from that versus the middlemen, um, whether those are financiers or whether those are, 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 are kind of corrupt public servants. And so it was really, the real question was, do you want to centralize production or do you not want to, or, or do you want to decentralize production? And, um, and Debs and Roosevelt believed that, you know, monopolies are natural, that, you, you know, it's just a centralization is just the way of the world, very similar to the neoliberal framework. And, uh, and Brandeis did not think that. Wilson did not think that. And they believed that there was uh, political agency in, in how we could structure our corporations. They were, they were in favor of co-ops. Um, Taft was not really, I don't think he was a huge fan of co-ops. But the actual ability to own the means of production was not, I mean, that was really, the question was really about whether that would be done centrally or whether you would have decentralized, decentralized kind of um, agglomerations of capital competing in markets. Okay. And, 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 and I think that's just important for people to understand because there's almost, it's like a slightly different plane of an argument, right? Where we're, um, we're looking at just like a slightly different because, and, and when we talk about producerism, uh, that, that takes us up uh, to Patman, but, but explain how producism, uh, producerism is a different, is different in terms of its conceit of of a, a Marxist perspective on what happens with, um, you know, relationship between labor and capital. Yeah. So, uh, so producerism, you go, go back to, you know, Thomas Jefferson or Thomas Paine, you know, the, the yeoman farmer model, um, whatever he, he who shall not work shall not eat, which you can go back to even earlier British, uh, the levelers in the 1600s, you know, just this idea that if you are, somebody who produces, you're a worker, you're an engineer, you're a businessman, a uh, businesswoman, um, you should gain the fruits of that, of that labor. And if you are a middleman um, or financier, then you should not gain the fruits of other people's labor, right? That was the ba- that's the basic idea. And the, the vision there is structure markets and structure uh, corporations and structure how human society to enable that and decentralize ownership of property to enable that. And I think the Marxist perspective, and I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, there are lots of different ways to talk about Marx. So I'm sure there's a bunch of Marxist perspectives, which would, would say, Oh, well, we totally agree with that. What I just said about Brandeis, but from my understanding and sort of from what the, the, the Debs and kind of the communist, um, the pre Soviet communist thought is their view was look, um, property itself is the problem private property itself is the problem. Therefore, what you really should do is just get rid of private property and have everything done communally and collectively through, you know, this, the centralized state government. And, um, and, you know, that's just, a, that's just a different vision. I mean, you see that today um, with, with sort of some people like Matt Brunig, who believes that. Um, but essentially, that would be everybody owns kind of a share of society, and then you collectively vote over what the kind of large decision maker does in that giant corporation. Um, and that, that, that's, I guess, the kind of division versus the other vision, which is actually everybody needs to have a little, bit, little piece of land instead of everybody working on a collective giant farm. Okay. So uh, now we get up to the, to the New Deal. Um, uh, Brandeis's uh, vision uh, wins the day uh, to some extent. I mean, obviously, you know, um, investment in... Uh, a, a, a lot of the New Deal also involved uh, investing in public works, um, and that how does right? But that's not. But that's not. That's not. Um, that's not a communist framework. I mean, there have been, you know, investment in public works has been something that, you know, that's that's five hundred years old, a thousand right. years old. It's that's not a the, the idea that the government creates roads or the, that the government creates, you know, infrastructure that it has collective obligations is not a. That's not something that like is a, you know, yes, there's, there's some centralization involved there, but it's, you know, we had the post office in 1792. This is not a um, part of that. That doesn't belong to this. They say the Marxist tradition. Right. And, and uh, but yet it, it, it I mean, the, 
theoretically, one could imagine a situation where it's like we don't want to give uh, the federal government. And I guess maybe there's competition in terms of, you know, municipal governments and state governments all have a different role in terms of uh, of dealing with roads, let's say. Um, and maybe there's, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm just trying to uh, the 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 gist of of the new deal was not just a function of antitrust that was just a big part of of how to deal with the problems that had come out of the depression well so okay so so it's not just antitrust antitrust is a specific type of law that's fairly narrow to deal with industrial um industrial companies anti-monopolization you know what not no no anti yes Part of it was anti-monopolization, but but the anti-monopoly tradition is much bigger than just antitrust, right? So antitrust goes after specific industrial companies. What happened in the 1920s is you saw this decade of corporatism where people lost faith in democracy. And that, and I go into Andrew Mellon, who's this like fascinating evil character, or he's sort of a villain. Um, he's Secretary of the Treasury, like does all sorts of self-dealing. It's like it's a very corrupt and fascinating decade. The KKK is ascendant. Everybody's demoralized. Who cares about democracy? And then in the 1930s, um, the the people who are essentially governing in that era are large financial holding companies, namely the Rockefellers, the DuPonts, the Mellons, and um, and the Rockefellers, DuPonts, the Mellons, and and J.P. Morgan, the bank. Right? Those guys are these are financial, effectively informal financial empires, and they control most of the business and political assets of the United States. Now, the New Deal was about attacking and destroying the power that those four families had over the American political economy. And he did that through the whole set of different policy choices and protests, including fiscal policy. So like um, breaking the control of the, that the bankers had over the Federal Reserve. Yes, there was antitrust labor policy. like So unionization, social welfare uh, and then financial policy, but also things like breaking up the electric utilities, which we also did, or breaking up aerospace companies, which we also did, or breaking up banks, which we also did. And then there was a whole bunch of fights over, you know, and this this took years. This took, you know, five to 10 years. It was like, imagine everything that Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders is proposing, and like 75% of that stuff gets done and then in five to 10 years. I mean, that's what the New Deal was actually about. And it was basically the only experiment that showed that democracy could work in the 1930s. Other than that, you had a bunch of weak democracies that were kind of flailing around and people were very unhappy, France and England. And then you had the um, you had fascism, which for a lot of people seemed to kind of deliver what the uh, democracies could not. And then you had the Soviet Union, which, again, I mean, this was all PR, but at the time people were like, oh, this. They, they're actually seem to be delivering kind of lifting people out of poverty. It's very much the way that like people lo- often look at China today. They have something that's kind of working. Um, and so the New Deal was so important because it did show that you could have a, a government and a, that was governed by its people, that we did not have to knuckle under to these private financial autocrats who were running things. And so, you know, today you see Mark Zuckerberg, right? He's kind of testifying before Congress as a business leader, but really not as a business leader, more as a political leader who's making choices about what we as a society get to see, right? And and that's the level of, and now the real debate today is between Elizabeth Warren and Mark Zuckerberg. It's not between any of the candidates. That's the level of, of political fight that we're dealing with today. And that's the level of political fight that we were dealing with from the 19 teens until the 1930s it was a fight between it was a fight over who governs the people through their democratic institutions or autocrats through financial holding companies and industrial monopolies. And OK, so let's let's go into just uh, tell us about Wright uh, Patman and uh, we will we will, you know, sort of, I guess, uh, work our way through um, most of the 20th century till we get to the to the 70s where this sort of falls apart. But tell us who Wright Patman was. Yeah, so Wright Patman is this uh, cotton tenant farmer from Texarkana, uh, which is sort of the border of of Texas, Arkansas, uh, Oklahoma, Louisiana. And he uh, he gets elected to Congress in 1928, takes office in 29, and he starts attacking Andrew Mellon and supporting, uh, trying to get World War I veterans 
uh, money that they were that they hadn't been paid during the war. He was he was like they should be paid. Um, basically, their pension should be accelerated. And this is not a big fight until the Depression when everything kind of collapses. And the veterans themselves start marching to D.C., very much like Occupy Wall Street. And they say, hey, we're poor. We fought for this country. You should you know, help us. The government should help us. And out of that, um, Patman ended up filing articles of impeachment against Andrew Mellon, who was blocking the payment to these veterans. And then Herbert Hoover tear gassed them. And that was, you know, and, and got rid of, you know, pushed them out of D.C. And it was the army. He ordered the army to do it. The army was led by Douglas MacArthur, Dwight D. Eisenhower, like sort of later heroes. Um, and and that was kind of the laid the foundation. This was called the bonus march that that uh, laid the foundation for the New Deal because it showed how corrupt and callous the old order was. And then I go into how FDR ended up outmaneuvering the monopolists in the Democratic Party in the 1932 primary who wanted to run on social issues and not the economy. And then he ended up defeating Hoover and had this kind of gang fight between, you know, he put Mellon on trial uh, for tax fraud. You know, this is the Secretary of the Treasury and the third richest guy in the country. And he goes on trial for tax fraud. You know, he breaks their power kind of systematically. Um, and it's this, it's it, not just FDR, but these these, um, you know, Wright Patman is, is hugely involved in this fighting against um, corruption, both in the corporate state in the banking world, also in, in the judiciary. There's there are massive fights within the judiciary. Um, and Patman is, is also fights against chain stores. So they had their Walmarts in the 1920s and 30s. It was called the A&P, which today we know of as a sort of a harmless store that went bankrupt a couple of years ago. But in the 1920s and 30s, it was the predatory Walmart of its day. And Patman led the fight to impose pricing laws to prevent them from driving their competitors out of business. And so over the course of the 19, uh, like the sort of the late 1920s, all the way into the 1970s, because Patman lasted, you know, he lived until 1976, and he eventually became the chair of the banking committee in the 60s. 48 um, years in Congress. 40, 46 years. 46 um, years. 46 years. Um, and then I think 15 years or, or 14 years as the head of the banking committee, he fought against concentration of power. He fought against banking deregulation. Um, and, and, you know, in some cases, he fought against his own party to impose that. Uh, and he was he 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 lost a lot of battles, uh, but he also won a lot of battles. And uh, then in 1976, and this is for kind of a lot of different reasons, but but mainly it was that um, the, a new generation of Democrats came into office in in 1974. It was a re- reaction to Watergate. Um, now, ironically, Patman, as the head of the banking committee, had actually been the first Democrat to investigate Watergate in 1972 before the election, um, and he he fought with. Um, with Nixon and ultimately his own party refused to allow him to get a subpoena into the Nixon White House. And so um, this new generation gets elected in 74, but this generation, and this is Bill Clinton's generation, they don't care about what Democrats have traditionally cared about, which is banking power and corporate power and monopolies. Instead, they're thinking about the Pentagon, right? They're thinking about environmentalism. They're thinking about a whole bunch of, of kind of Uh, a different vision of social justice that was created in the 1950s that airbrushed all of the fights that we used to have about corporate power out of our collective memory. And this is the Watergate baby generation. And then behind the scenes, one of the first things that happened is the bankers manipulated them into voting Patman out of his committee assignment chairing the banking committee. And 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 so they got the bankers managed to finally, in the end, get rid of Wright Patman. And then later, a few, a few months later, he ended up, he died. But that was the moment, 1975, when they got rid of Patman, in which the Democratic Party adopted a new philosophy of cooperating with concentrated capital. And that same Congress, they got rid of the laws that were protecting the American independent retailer and manufacturer from chain stores. And so in 1970, Walmart has $30 million, $40 million of revenue. By 1980, it has a billion dollars of revenue. And this is because in 1975, Congress, this Democratic Congress, this Watergate baby Congress, gets rid of um, some of the pricing rules that it constrained chain stores. And then, dereg- you know, late in, they start doing deregulation. And this right. is the Democrats who are doing it because they believe in it, right? And, and Ralph Nader is actually pushing deregulation. All right, hold so on one second. Whole- so I want to get into to Ralph Nader, but I just want to, like, just sort of 
you know, uh, plant a flag here and just say, I think in the past, I think we've talked to you about this, about the Atari Democrats. Uh, we've uh, done a couple of interviews with Lily Geismer. This era, there was a lot of things going on within the Democratic Party. This was almost one feature of it, but it was all sort of emanating uh, uh, around this a similar push, right, where um, the the Democrats uh, largely, I mean, uh, uh, abandon labor. Maybe that's two or I should say unions um, in, in particular uh, on some level to to make ostensibly the primary purpose, the primaries uh, more democratic in some ways. Um, and we also see the sort of the adoption of um, uh, what you call social justice or maybe uh, emancipation movements or uh, environmentalism. Other um, uh, other issues become to the fore. How much, though, we should say at this point, like when Patman um, is jettisoned, we should also say that that he was part of his coalition was built on a certain amount of 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 racism. Yes. I mean, is that fair to say? Yeah, no, that's true. So so um, yes, that's right. He had vote. So Patman has an interesting relationship with race. This is very complicated. Uh, but in, in so in the 1920s, he fought against the Klan. Right in rural Texas, he was the deep, you know, very out opposed to the Klan. Um, and we should say this is when the Klan had was basically. I think there was six million card carrying members in 1920 out of a population of 100 million. That's a lot of people to be proud Klan members, right? I mean, you know, who knows if there was any ashamed ones? But that's a lot. That's a huge portion of the population. Yeah, the mayor of Portland, Oregon, and Portland, Maine were both a uh, Klan in 1922. I mean, it was a, it was a mainstream uh, movement that was based on you know, there's, it's fascinating. But but Patman was opposed to the Klan, and Patman also did a bunch of things that were um, like he he made sure that economic power. He tried to distribute economic power regardless of race. Um, he got the first black um, member uh, of of the board of governors of the Federal Reserve on the the board in the 1960s. Um, he passed uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is an anti-discrimination statute in, I guess, 69 or 70, um, actually uh, going around his own committee. But he also voted for segregation in the early 50s and was a signer of this of the um, the Southern Manifesto. And and he said very explicitly in the 70s why he did that, which is I would have lost my seat in rural Texas if I hadn't. Uh, and he was also he was getting, you know, there were always primary candidates that the the far right wing was putting up against him, saying he was insufficiently dedicated to the cause of segregation. Um, but what what happened by 1975 is not that there was like nobody in in 75 really pushed Patman out because of of race. So that wasn't the issue. And and he had um, defenders in Congress who were who were black, uh, and he had people in Congress who were black who opposed him. You know, the issue was just. And I talked to a bunch of the the Watergate baby members. They were just like, oh, he was. He was too old. Um, and the, the neoliberal generation that emerged in 1975, it's not that they were like they were like, oh, race is actually what matters um, versus the, the old, you know, the older generation who were saying, you know, oh, no, actually, race doesn't matter. It's all about economic power. That's not what the debate was. Uh, the debate were, were two different visions of racial justice. And one of the visions of racial justice, um, which was also about economic justice, was we need to have a democracy and undo the um, uh, undo the institutional concentrations of power that enable discrimination of both against African-Americans and women and the small shopkeeper. Um, and the other, um, and this was the neoliberal framework, was basically we need to have, um, uh, we need to allow discrimination against the small shopkeeper and against the little guy. Um, but we need to make sure that, you know, in this kind of greed is good paradigm, that nobody exploits gender or racial uh, identity to uh, advantage themselves. They can do other things. They can they can ex exploit fraud. They can exploit corruption. But that that is a no no. So now both of these visions of a kind of multicultural oligarchy and a multicultural democracy have embedded in them a vision of social justice and a vision of racial justice. Uh, but they are different. I wouldn't say that the Patman vision, which really comes back from Brandeis, um, you know, you could go back and, you know, Frederick Douglass hated monopolies. And there's a whole, you know, sort of interesting racial dynamic here. That one, it's not, I don't think it's as simple as saying, 
oh, Patman was racist and this new generation wasn't. I think you, you, you know, anyway, so that's just a well, but I mean, put aside different vision, right? But I mean, put aside, put aside, um, whatever, you know, whatever Patman's actual feelings were, right? I mean, clearly he was constrained by a racist consistent uh, constituency. And I guess really in terms of because ultimately what you're writing about is power. Right. And, and at the end of the day, like I say, you know, what was in his heart or even what, you know, um, what, what was really relevant is to like to what extent he could push the limits of his constituency's pa uh, patience and to what extent. Well, you know, no, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying that that the laws that we don't think of as anti-discrimination measures like anti-chain store laws or laws that prevent, you know, monopolization, that, that those are actually also very important civil rights laws that we just don't think of as such. And those are the laws that Patman was protecting and that uh, Brandeis was protecting and that, you know, those are the first laws that Bork attacked. And those are the, the laws that the Watergate baby generation got rid of. So so that, that's what I'm saying. It's not that that um, it's not that like Patman couldn't. Yeah, I mean, he he voted for segregation. There's there's no there's no getting around that. And it was it was, you know, that's that's an, an immoral an immoral thing to do. What I'm saying is that the neoliberal generation, the deal that was cut in 1975 and 76 was a deal to entrench a different form and much more pernicious form of racism uh, than the one that came out of the New Deal. I'm I'm yeah, that's that that's all this is about. You destroy black banks, you destroy um, you destroy black stores, you know, you destroy black economic power. That is a form of racism that is extremely vicious. It just happens through monopolization and predatory pricing. Um, and we don't sort of see it as kind of a civil rights um, problem, but we should. And that is an ideological flaw in the way that the civil rights movement has kind of thought about the world since the 1975 or so. I mean, neoliberalism is everywhere. It is in the civil rights movement today. It is in the way that we think about race today. And that's a problem, right? Right. And I, and I guess that's where I'm trying to get at is just sort of examine like the difficulty it seems to be is that the, uh, in, in, you know, and in, in stipulating that I, I think you're right, like the sort of the um, the the material implications in terms of how it impacts um, uh, a race of neoliberal policies uh, in many ways are are, are more dramatic uh, than um, you know long term at least in terms of like accruing power for these communities uh, than the no the let me let me put it let me put it in a more stark way Obama's a black president right he oversaw the largest theft of black wealth in our lifetimes and maybe in 80 years. Okay. We have no way to talk about that because neo, the, the neoliberal dis framework of race is designed to obscure power. And it's a racist framework. It is, it is a, it's not as bad as Jim Crow, but it was a reactionary turn in 1975 and 1976 so that we cannot honestly talk about race. Nobody can honestly talk about race because that is what happened. That's what happened in 2008 to, to, to 2014. And I brought this up over and over and over, and Democrats cannot come to grips with it. They can't handle it because they are enthralled to the, to the neoliberal framework on power and money and business and race and everything else. And I wrote this book to explain what happened, to explain why we're in this framework. But I don't accept, I just the framing of the way that we talk about race is fundamentally dishonest today. Yeah, I mean, I and I think, you know, uh, you and I had that conversation, I think, in the lead up to the 2012 election, actually. But uh, and, 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 and I, I, I'm not I'm not disagreeing with 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 um, that assessment, but I'm but it's it doesn't tell uh, you know, I'm saying I'm, I'm also suggesting that there's another half of that story, which is that um, it, it, it doesn't strike me as a coincidence that Patman came from a background that, you know, and, and I'm not talking about him personally, but but his constituency was also happened to be uh, racist. And and and, you know, y you and I may uh, may or may not agree or disagree. I don't know on on the implications of their racism as terms of how it materially impacts, um, uh, you know, black people, let's say. Um, and, and I'm not even sure that, um, you know, uh, 
you and I can assess like what's the most important thing there. And it's not it's not really relevant to the point I'm Look, making. The, the 1920s the, were a fascist era. I mean, you, you're you, you, let's just call Jim Crow what it was in the South. It was fascism. Like that's what would, and it was it was sustained terrorist violence against uh, against particular against black people. Um, it was not as bad against poor white people, but it did disenfranchise poor white right. people, and it particularly singled out black people with economic power. Those were the people who were often the targets of of lynchings. Those were the people. That's why they burned down, you know, Black Wall Street in Tulsa. This was a Jim Crow was a system that was designed to keep black people in servitude by attacking the economic, by the foundations of their economic power. Now, Patman broke from that somewhat because he was trying to deal with breaking the hold that concentrated northern capital, which was an important part of Jim Crow, by the way. He was trying to say, you know, we're going to break from that. And then the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s built on top of the New Deal and said, no, we're actually, now that we've kind of shown that there can be an imperfect democracy, we're going to try to let all people, um, black and white and women and gay, we're going to try to let them all into this democracy. The whole point is, is that in 1975, the Watergate babies, and then they got, much, they got corrupted in the 1980s, but the Watergate babies decided that democracy did not incorporate economic power. Right. And that is a deeply, deeply reactionary thing to do. Now you can go back and say, oh, you know, Patman's constituents were racist. Absolutely. And you can go back to, you know, the 1870s and discover kind of why that racism was created, why that was engendered. Right. And that was a propaganda campaign after the Civil War um, put forward. Actually, after the financial crisis of 1873, it was put forward by northern capital. Um, so the, the fight here is complicated and always has to do with, with political and economic power, and it manifests itself through racial terrorism. Um, but, but to just kind of like the way that we talk about the problem today airbrushes out all of those questions of power so that we can get to this libertarian framework of saying, and I'm not saying you're saying this, I'm saying that this is kind of the way that I hear the right, racial discussion right. today. It's always just what is in your heart as an individual, right? Are you... Do you believe in equality as an individual or not? And it's like that doesn't matter. What matters is whether equality is embedded in our institutions of power, because there are always going to be jerks. There are always going to be people that want to bully others. The question in a democracy is whether you can make sure that everybody has equal rights and that no one can use uh, power to bully other people. That's, that's kind of where we have to go. Uh, and that is the that that is a populist, more democratic approach to uh, addressing the problem of 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 discrimination against the powerful versus the powerless. All right, and 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 just and and just to be clear, like I I uh, agree with that perspective. All I'm I'm suggesting uh, two things. One is is that um, I think there has to be some sensitivity to the lived experience of people who are uh, subjected to racism. Uh, in a you know in a on an individual level a but that, that that's a you know I, I think that's an important thing to, to say but I'm also suggesting that there's a relationship between the um, largely poor white um, uh, constituency and their relationship uh, to racism um, that allowed a guy like Patman to function in the way that he was functioning. And I'm just saying that that's the other half of that. Um, you know, there are the forces that, that took Patman out, but there were also the forces that, that maintained him. Um, and I'm just suggesting that that is, um, also, you know, like an important part of the story, but let's, so what's the, so it's an interesting question. Patman was, was, um, Patman's political power actually came through, uh, postal, uh, rural postmasters. So before, you know, he had he had the postmasters essentially delivering his direct mail um, and talking to people. And his you know, the, the reason people voted for him is because he uh, delivered roads and and uh, and farm supports and Social Security and rural electrification. Uh, that that's you know, that's why he had a whole bunch of people. I mean, if, if his constituents were just in, into white supremacy, they wouldn't have picked Patman because he there were always people. There were right. often people running against him who were, who were more um, w w white supremacists than he was. 
it, it was actually it was just about delivering the things that that they that they wanted and and needed on a material basis. And then when you know the Civil Rights Act uh, passed and and there was uh, uh, Black people in the district got the right to vote, they they tended to vote for Patman. Um, so it was it was uh, his his political support. Uh, came from the thing that that Democrats in 1975, when they transitioned to this kind of um, concentrated capital um, TV friendly politics, they started losing that immediately. Um, and and his supporters, a lot of his supporters were uh, in credit unions and and uh, pharmacists and small business people, right? And those people supported Patman and they supported the Democrats largely because the FTC protected small business from chain stores and protected small business from monopolists. And almost immediately in the late 1970s, when Jimmy Carter, you know, under the influence of Ralph Nader, turned the FTC against small business under the grounds that they needed to protect consumers. And it didn't matter whether big, whether it were big or small businesses, we just have to go after and protect consumers and not care about business at all. Almost immediately, the FTC uh, was pushed back aggressively. They lost their uh, constituency base. And then when Reagan came into office in 1981, he effectively just turned out the lights at the FTC and nobody cared because the small business constituency set had, had lost faith in the, in the FTC and the Democratic Party to do anything. So the loss of that anti-monopoly sentiment, that battle against concentrated power had really significant impacts. And then when Walmart came in and just chewed up the entire small business constituency in the South and in the Rust Belt, all of those civic leaders who had been the civic leadership for the Democratic Party disappeared, right? And that's the creation of, of Red and Blue America right there. All right, and let's let's get explicit about the sort of three projects that came together because one of them was that that consumer movement, and I think people's that's a little bit counterintuitive for people to to sort of see like the consumer movement um, being one of the uh, the pillars of of what has happened with our uh, anti monopolism uh, in this country, financialization, and then the Chicago School, um, which is you know uh, the, all three are related, but but just walk us through those three projects. Yeah, so, uh, so the, the, the Chicago School, the Law and Economics Movement, I have a chapter in my book about this. They were created in the late, 19, uh, late 1940s, early 50s. And they, uh, this was a kind of reconstruction of robber baron capitalism. And so it was a, it was a very cynical guy named Aaron Director who trained Milton Friedman, uh, George Stigler, Robert Bork. And he, he was actually the brother-in-law of Milton Friedman. And he... Uh, he grew up in um, Portland, Oregon in the 20s. He's Jewish, Russian immigrant. And so he was very cynical about democracy because the people around him were, you know, anti-Semitic and in the KKK. Uh, and so he took this a very elitist attitude. First, he became a socialist. And then eventually he went to the University of Chicago and was funded by this right wing uh, lunatic named Harold Lernow. And, and he created neoliberalism. He broke conservatism away from anti-monopoly thinking a lot of conservatives had hated the government and labor, but they also hated monopolies. Aaron Director is the guy who said, no, no, we're going to hate government. We're going to hate labor, but we're going to support monopolies and support concentrated capital. And he built a whole intellectual project that centered the University of Chicago to uh, create the tools, the legal tools to, to unleash concentrated capital and to undo the New Deal. Um, but he wouldn't have been successful unless the second trend, financialization, had had not occurred. And this was this was done by a guy named Walter Riston at, at National City or, or Citibank. So Walter Riston, again, same thing, got his start in the late 40s, early 50s at, at National City. The banking system was really heavily controlled. And he's the most important banker since J.P. Morgan. And he's the guy who really led early deregulation, had bitter fights with Wright Patman in the 1960s uh, over undoing the, the New Deal financial controls, particularly around where banks could get deposits. And, um, and when he undid, the, he undid those New Deal controls in 1961 with something called the Certificate, Negotiable Certificate of Deposit, all of a sudden you saw massive uh, increases in capitalization in the stock market. You saw it was called the go-go years uh, and, and conglomerates, which were an early prelude to uh, mutual funds, the early prelude to the 1980s and, and financial power. And that started slamming into the real economy in the late 1960s, and particularly in 1970, when it, the train system, Penn Central, 
uh, much of the train system in the Northeast went bankrupt. It was the largest bankruptcy in American history. It was sort of the Enron of its day. And that's what actually led to the conservatives deciding, business elite deciding to organize uh, politically. So that's why they wrote the Powell memo. That's why they did a bunch of the kind of things that we just think, oh, they got greedy in the early 70s. It's like, no, no, what happened is the financial system was in crisis. Corporate America was in crisis. And they, they started to have a political debate about what to do. Um, and it was because financialization had slammed into the real economy, uh, had bankrupted the train system, and it's because of the forces that Walter Riston had let loose. Pavin had been fighting him, uh, but he wasn't able to totally stop it, although he did stop a bailout of Penn Central. And then the third force is the consumer rights movement. And this is really John Kenneth Galbraith and uh, Richard Hofstetter, again, late 1940s, early 50s. All of this is in the specter of the McCarthy reactionary movement. Who, the, some of the funders of McCarthy Red Scare were also behind the law and economics movement. Um, so these guys uh, were, were corporate liberals, and they rewrote the history. They, they were very important. So Galbraith and Hofstetter rewrote our history, and they got rid of the idea that fights happened in the late 19th century around the money trust and corporate power. They said, that's all fake. In fact, what was happening is these farmers who were fighting the bankers and railroads, they weren't really fighting them. They were actually just Anglo-Saxons who were afraid of uh, losing their, um, their WASP privilege. It was a fight over what was called status anxiety. Um, and then with that new framework, they developed, Galbraith developed this something called affluence, which was this notion that America was just this endlessly affluent society and we didn't need to fight over corporate power anymore. We had figured that out. There was no inequality or inequality was not important. Monopolies were progressive, all this stuff that he kind of framed. And he taught the entire... Uh, counterculture, because he was very opposed to the war in Vietnam, and in many ways was heroic, but his ideas were catastrophic. And the, the counterculture in the 1960s and, and um, learned from Galbraith and Hofstetter and C. Wright Mills and a whole bunch of people who hated small business and, um, and didn't, didn't want to have debates over corporate power or they were just socialists, they learned to not care about uh, monopolies. And then in the 1970s, they became this consumer rights movement led by Ralph Nader, who said, it was very similar to what consumer rights people said in the 19-teens and 20s, that production doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is consumers. And so chain stores can be good. And the only thing that matters is, is sort of price and safety and quality. Uh, workers didn't matter. Unions don't matter. Big business, big unions, both corrupt. Big government corrupt. The only thing that matters is consumerism. And then they got fooled. In the 1970s, you have this crisis in corporate America caused by financialization, and then you have the law and economics movement, and you have the last of the populace like Phil Hart, Hubert Humphrey, and Wright Patman saying, save the shopkeeper, break up big business, and then you have this consumer rights movement that's sitting in, in the middle, and they end up mostly aligning with the law and economics guys and pushing for deregulation and pushing for financialization. And they didn't know what they were doing. Nader didn't know what he was doing, but he does things like he creates the corporate right to free speech. He pushes for banking deregulation and airline deregulation and trucking deregulation. And, and that's, that's what kind of, that's why the Carter administration is a catastrophe. And then Reagan gets into office. By the time Reagan gets into office, there is no more debate, right? right? The left, Patman's died, Phil Hart's died, Humphrey's died, and there's no one to carry the torch. And so this new generation of Watergate babies is in charge, and they basically agree with Reagan, that corporate concentration is inevitable, is progressive, is um, and let's, is is natural, and scientific. And just to explain to people like why they felt that way, and this is how we got the sort of the Borkian um, uh, version of of uh, of antitrust um, is that these this concentration leads to cheaper products. Maybe, you know, uh, theoretically, maybe like, you know, uh, well, e we can uh, get it overnight delivered uh, to us now. I mean, it, it's all based upon a looking at the world through the lens exclusively of how much stuff can I consume and in, in its most convenient way. That's right. Um, and and our, our legal framework was, was structured so that we stopped caring about uh, competitive process and concentrations of power, essentially our biggest bad uh, skepticism, and moved towards, as you put it, consumer price. And so something like Google or Facebook, they both offer free. They're free. They're, you don't have to pay for them with money. Obviously, you pay with other things. 
Um, but it's very hard for the way that we interpret antitrust laws today to see the concentration of power in the hands of Google or Facebook or Amazon. It's not impossible. It's just that, that you know, there, there are other things going on. The, but the, that, these are like so externalities, right? I mean, this is sort of a classic case of, of some externalities insofar as that we don't realize where we're paying for these free services or these reduced price services in the cont because it's not doesn't show up necessarily as as dollars as much as it does i mean ultimately it might uh but it it shows up in the context of political power and um a uh sort of i guess things that are a little bit less tangible in the context of society well it's just that it's just that we as consumers aren't the ones paying the price. The people that are paying the price are the publishers and the sellers through Amazon, right? So traditionally, you would have like a seller going through it, through it, an Amazon or a sell. Like the Standard Oil fight was between Wildcatters and Standard Oil as the distributor of the oil. It wasn't necessarily about consumer prices, although there was there was some of that. And so it's like if you're looking at at Walmart or you're looking at Amazon or you're looking at Google, you don't don't look on the consumer side for the for the problem, you look on the producer side, it's the workers, it's the suppliers, it's the manufacturers getting screwed. So if, if we wanted to apply the law like we used to, it would be easy to find the harm. It's just that the harm is not necessarily when you log into your Facebook account. It's the death. Uh, it's the fact that Facebook is appropriating the revenue, the advertising revenue that used to go to the New York Times. Facebook is now getting it because they're able to take the data effectively from every every publisher on the internet, they're able to coercively take that data and then outcompete them because data is really important in terms of selling advertising. So it's like, it's not hard to figure out how to use the law to a attack the concentration of power. It's just that if you're seeing things from the consumer standpoint, instead of from a citizen standpoint or a producer standpoint, right. then you don't see the power. Right. That's my point is that these externalities yeah. are in a different currency, if you will, or just a different silo of our existence, which has been largely devalued. I mean, I think at least in the popular uh, culture, I mean, I, I, I've heard you, you know, uh, talk about the, you know, just the implications of the blogs when um, uh, Google basically came in and bigfooted everybody and uh, dried up all the advertising yes. revenue and, and the implications of that just in terms of like the different voices we hear. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's um, we we are we are increasingly living in an autocracy in the commercial side of our lives, right? So we get bossed around. You know, whether you're a chicken farmer, you're an Uber driver, um, or you're a, an, an engineer at Boeing, like you increasingly have less and less agency. You might have a nicer servitude depending on where you are, um, but it's not a surprise that as people get used to being bossed around in the commercial sector, in the trade that they do, that they increasingly get used to being bossed around in the political sector. And that's why you see rising autocracy. That's what Trump is. But that, that's also what you see all over the world. Monopolization is a form of autocracy. It's a private government. That's what's going on. We are having these many private governments linked together by Wall Street, organizing our society. Um, so, so how do, well, I mean, I, I still have a, a lot I wanted to get to, but, um, and I guess the question is, is sort of how do you, um, what's the best way to tackle this, but how do you get people to care? You know, I mean, like I, I you know, well, they, like, I mean, how do you say, they do care. what's that? They do care. In Goliath, I go into this. It, it's it, they do care. I think people, people just don't have the language to understand that, like what, uh, at what to do. And they don't have the language to think of themselves as citizens. So in Goliath, you know, I talk about what I mean, the preface is about how um, how we just didn't know that this was our heritage. Right. And I wrote this book so that people would understand that the history of America in the 20th century, which is really the history that's like the America was kind of the central area of debate in the world at that for most of the 20th century. Um, that history is about. The heritage, it's, that's our heritage, and the suspicion that we feel towards concentration, concentrated power, which we all feel, is, is very American, right? The idea that we want fair markets, that we want, um, we want to get rid of the financier manipulating us, 
as a political matter, that is deeply embedded in the American experiment. And we have to know that in order to reclaim our liberties as a free people. Uh, I mean, but what if somebody says, like, you know, all that sounds great, but I, I, I like, you know, I like just being able to go on my computer and I, I want a pair of sneakers and it comes here in two days. Well, look, I mean, you're going to, it ultimately, we're going to have to make the argument for freedom, right? I mean, that's, that's, just, that's just the reality. It's like if somebody really wants two-day shipping and they're willing to give up their liberty for two-day shipping, then, and that's the thing that they care about most in the world, we're, we're going to lose that. Right. We're going to lose. We lose our freedom. We lose our democracy. But the reality is you can have two-day shipping without, um, without losing your democracy. Like none of these, you can have flight without having American Airlines charge you baggage fees. There's nothing inherent about the technology that commands a certain um, political regulatory schema. However, um, ultimately, this is a question of values, and it is a question of whether we want to be a free people or whether we don't. And that's the debate that we're having. That's the debate that Bernie, um, that Warren, um, that, that Trump, that Buttigieg, that they're, they're all articulating their position on that question. And some people are saying, yeah, you know what, I am willing to sell my heritage, as, as Brandeis put it, for a mess of pottage, right? He, as a consumer, you're willing to do anything for that two-day shipping. And there are others who are saying, no, I want to live in a society where I am not in servitude to others. And I add, there, I mean, there's also, you know, there are broader implications in terms of what we're doing. Uh, we pay that price in uh, other political decisions and, and arguably things like wage, wage stagnation and, and et cetera, uh, when we are, uh, you know, signing up for, for that type of, of monopoly. All right. So last. Right. I mean, it's not, it's not like we're living in an economic paradise. Right. Like this, it's like the, the whole framework is ridiculous. But like even accepting that. All right. So lastly, uh, Warren and Bernie, what from your perspective, um, because I think there are, you know, uh, uh, folks in these parts who who would argue that it's not uh, the difference between them is not of 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 a matter of degree, but rather of a kind. What's your perspective on that? I don't think they have really I don't think there's really much difference ideologically. Uh, I think they're different. They have different political priorities, different political styles. But, you know, uh, uh, Bernie used to carry around Wright Patman um, reports when he would walk around Vermont in the 70s from the banking committee talking about chain banking. Elizabeth Warren, uh, you know, she knows Patman. She very much is like comes out of that Patman style opposition to concentrated power, uh, the hearings, the, you know, the, 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 the rigor, um, the anti-monopolism. It's it's both. You know, both of them effectively want to want to uh, distribute a little bit of property to everybody. Um, they both kind of have a Brandeisian frame. They both are essentially New Deal Democrats. It's the same tradition. They obviously have a different, like, kind of different styles, uh, maybe different approaches to gaining political power. Uh, a lot of the like attempts to explain, you know, to explain one of them as kind of inherently more, you know, better or whatever. It's just like. It's kind of annoying. Um, Warren is a much stronger um, bureaucratic leader. She will ride a bureaucracy to do things. Bernie is much more, he's a, he's a more capable communicator to the broad public. Um, I don't think that you can say that one of them is, is, is kind of better. They are different. I am not convinced that either one of them is perfect. I think there are problems with both. I think there are benefits to both. But by and large, the disagreement over Bernie and Warren comes from the basic fact that Obama was a terrible president and neither side can admit it. And so when Warren, a lot of Warren's accomplishments are in preventing Obama from doing the horrible things that he really wanted to do. And she can't brag about that because Democrats love Obama and she has to get their votes. And I think what Bernie was really doing in 2016 was running against the shitty legacy of Obama. But he can't brag about that because Democrats like Obama. So that's really the subtext for all of this. And I, I don't, I, you know, I think there are legitimate grounds for, for criticism of both of them, but I just don't think that philosophically they really disagree. Um, and you don't think there is a, um, uh, the, the relevance of, of um, uh, some programs being means tested versus universality that doesn't uh, as a, as a political tactic or mechanism in which to sort of, um, uh, you know, 
raise an awareness of of people's role beyond uh, a consumer? The, the, none of that moves you? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, you could you could just as easily say, you know, Warren says she wants to break up big tech, and Bernie just doesn't. Bernie wants to say, oh, we need an antitrust attorney general who will enforce the antitrust laws, which is a, you know, that's a um, subtle way of not calling for breaking up big tech. But I don't think that like Bernie is not going to be aggressive on you know, on dealing with big tech. I, I think that like Warren is certainly has a more aggressive plan, but I'm not going to like, I mean, I think we all know where Bernie is coming from in the same way. I think we all know where Warren is coming from, or at least, you know, so I, I'm not, I don't, the parsing those kind of small distinctions on, on kind of these plans. is just, it's just kind of, it, it's like, it's, it's sort of silly. Um, and I mean, I think you can, you could definitely make the argument that like Bernie and his plans, um, on social welfare have been a little bit more left wing and, you know, Warren on her plan on, on, you know, ag and, and tech have been um, more, more populist and more opposed to concentrated power. And I think those are fine debates to have. Um, I think there's legitimate grounds for criticizing the CFPB for, you know, not being particularly effective. I think there's legitimate grounds for criticizing Bernie for not really doing much on the foreclosure crisis. I think there's legitimate grounds for going after, you know, for, for putting sort of both of them through the ringer, and we should do that. But the basic problem is Democrats have been terrible, and Democrats, particularly Obama, was terrible. And we have to reckon with that, and both Warren and Bernie have, have, uh, ha- can't fully reckon with it because the Democratic base, including the left, by the way, uh, and we had that debate in 2012. And um, and I remember, you know, like I was the only one out there saying this guy is no good. Right. And I'm still pretty much one of the only people saying he did a bad job and we have to reckon with that. Like, that's the fundamental problem here. And that's why, like, this kind of shadow boxing over Warren and Bernie is kind of besides the point. Um, uh, fair enough. And people can go back and listen, uh, to, uh, that conversation that we had, uh, I must've been pre 2012, right? Yeah, that's, that's I right. I mean, I think you've been I, on I a couple of wrong. times since then, but, um, um, and, and, and to be fair, we also did have, there was, um, uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but from the black agenda report, um, it was Glenn Ford, actually, I think we had on. Uh, making a a similar argument, um, uh, uh, maybe not necessarily the exact same terms that that, that you were arguing at that time. Um, yeah, I was arguing for voting for third party in 2012, um, or not voting for Obama, even in swing states. And like the guy who was opposed to us was 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 Mitt Romney. I remember at the time people were like, "Oh my gosh, he's the worst! I can't believe Mitt Romney. You know how dare you?" And it's like today, Mitt Romney is like a hero of the resistance. Like it was embarrassing. It's embarrassing. People should be embarrassed about their political judgment. It was really bad. Well, I mean, if it uh, makes any difference, I am not a fan of Mitt Romney's today. <laughs> uh, well, no, that's fair. Right. I mean, I but I'm I'm not a fan of Obama or right, Mitt Romney. Right. I mean, like, <laughs> like, all right. It, it's a relative question. Well, uh, nevertheless. Uh, Goliath, the hundred year war between monopoly uh, power and democracy. Uh, Matt Stoller, uh, really appreciate you coming on today and I think the book is fantastic. Thanks so much for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.